Hi, my name is Jay. Welcome to my channel. Today I thought I'd share with you how exactly I started and got into backpacking itself. As many of you know, I will be through hiking the Appalachian Trail next year starting February. And I thought I'd share my story of how I was introduced into backpacking with the rest of the community here and maybe everyone else could share their stories. But I grew up, well, originally I was born in Korea, but then we moved to the suburbs of Chicago and I grew up there pretty much most of my life. And having grown up there, like we didn't know anything about backpacking. We didn't know any like outdoorsy people. We did go on car camping trips as a family, but that was more because it's much more economical than going to a motel or a hotel. So we always drove out, camp somewhere. But until about 2002, I, I actually never had a full backpack on my body. And that was really just because of the Marine Corps. I was in the Marine Corps from 2002 to 2007. So during that time, we spent plenty of time outdoors. Not showering for a week at a time was normal <laughs> for a long period of time. So that got me used to it. But when I got out of the Marine Corps in 2007, I didn't do any of that. Um, I just moved back to the suburbs and then I moved down downtown Chicago, got a job downtown. And really there's no place around there you can go backpacking for hours, at least an hour and a half north into Wisconsin. And if you're gonna go south, it's over two hours. So I didn't know anybody that did it and I just never did it. And I didn't really think anything of it. Now, in October 2010, I adopted Liza. She was a, from a rescue group. She was picked up just a few days before. And I got her October 2010. And ever since then, she changed my world, really. Um, I spent every minute with her. Even maybe a year after, as work got more stressful, everything was worth it. Like when you come home, and you get to touch your pet, just made everything worthwhile. So she was basically the center of my life. And then unfortunately, in June of 2013, she was diagnosed with cancer. Unfortunately, because the veterinarians we saw thought she had some symptoms, but she was far too young because she was only five years old, that could have been cancer the cancer actually progressed much further before we actually went to an oncologist and they diagnosed it. They gave her six months uh, with the cancer she had, which she had multiple myeloma. I don't know how much you know about it. Um, it's pretty horrible cancer. The only symptoms are just extreme pain in your bones. It's a cancer that grows in the marrow and it basically sends out chemicals that deteriorates your bone. So you basically wind up with just micro fractures throughout your entire body. And one of the surefire diagnosis methods is in an x-ray, you'll see little, not cracks, but you'll see mini cracks like throughout the skeleton. And it's, it's pretty, pretty horrible cancer. Um, it's just all about pain management. For humans, you can get bone marrow transplants, but for dogs, there's nothing much. You go on chemotherapy to kind of control the cancer, and then you go on various other drugs to control the pain and to help rebuild the bones. But they say within six months, none of that would work, and that's the life expectancy. I'm sorry, I meant one year after the diagnosis, it's usually that's, that's it. And she was only five years old at the time she was diagnosed. And when I say I spent all my time with her, I mean, I can't, it's not even an exaggeration. I was with her for three years, 104 days. But in that time, she was the most amazing dog ever. Like she knew every trick any typical dog would know. She knew how to do a handstand against the wall. Um, she, she could fetch anything. I could actually hide something in a field 
and just using my arms and commands like a director and she'll keep looking back at me and I'll direct her and she'll find whatever I want. Hey, wait, good girl, Liza. Back, back, around, back, around. Around, around, good girl, around, around. Good girl, come, sit, sit, sit. Good girl, good girl, Liza. Okay, next trick. There's a tree over there. I'm gonna try to make her go around that pretty far. Liza, over, around, over, around, over, around, around, sit, back, around, around. Good girl, come here, come here. She was so smart that you could say fetch treat bag and then she'll go out and actually get her bag of treats that I used to train her with and she would bring the bag over uh, one time. It's funny, I said, Liza, fetch treat bag and she ran off and she didn't come back for a while and I checked and uh, treats spilled out of the bag and they were just everywhere and then she was kind of dragging the bag. She wasn't sure what to do, <laughs> but she didn't eat any of it. She just stood there and it was pretty funny. And I could say fetch leash and then she'll run off, get a leash and bring it back to me. Um, she could do anything. One time I had foot surgery and then I sat on my recliner and I saw that my pain reliever pills were on the other end of the couch. I just pointed over and said, Liza, fetch. And then she brought me the pain relievers. Perfect. Like that's a, that's a true service animal right there. I even got her to the point where you could be out in the middle of a field and I could say, back heel and then she'll run over and actually heel next to you and i could tell her to go around and she'll go around you and i could say circle and then she would actually go around you backwards to where she originally was she could do anything and it was so easy and quite amazing all all my time was with her when i was at work i would think about what we do during the weekend and on the weekend both days we'd go places i had dog park permits for her for all over. So we had an option to just go anywhere. And we visited different dog parks all the time just to keep things different. And that was my life for a little, little under three and a half years. Um, she knew so many commands. It was actually pretty amazing at times because I would just talk to her normally and then I'd throw out the words she knew so she would do them and it just it was amazing. and. I remember the one time I like totally fell in love with her. I was doing laundry and I was, uh, I was in a condo in Chicago and there's a, you take the clothes out of the dryer. I usually threw it on the bed to fold it there. And I took a big bundle and I was walking and I felt something drop and I thought, oh, I'll just go get it later. Put everything on the bed and I turned around and there was Liza with a sock in her mouth just sitting there right next to me and then you know it was kind of slobbery but it's the intentions that i appreciate and she had it right there for me i didn't tell her anything she just brought it for me and i thought that was pretty amazing but come around december or so she was on hydromorphone which is a drug that's stronger than morphine and then after that she was actually on fentanyl and I didn't even know about fentanyl back then. Uh, it's been in the news a lot lately, but there's not much stronger than fentanyl. And she was starting to develop a tolerance to all those pain relievers. So come January, um, I decided it was time. And uh, January 21st, she... Uh, Went to sleep. It's been seven years. I thought I could talk about this whole thing without tearing up, but it's hard. Okay. So after she died, um, I changed. Um, I just wanted to get away from everything. 
While I was with her, I used to watch like various survival shows like Survivor Man, Man vs. Wild, although that's, you know, that's more for our entertainment. Um, Man, Woman, Wild, Alone came on in 2014. Uh, I even watched Fat Guys in the Woods, <laughs> Dual Survival, all those shows. And I always enjoyed those things, but I thought I would never be able to experience outdoors because I didn't really know anybody else that was outdoorsy at all. So I didn't really think anything about backpacking, but sometime after Liza passed away, I was looking around on YouTube because I've always searched her before for other things, but somehow or another, I came upon a channel called Outdoor Gear Review, and it's ran by Luke, and he did mostly solo backpacking trips, and I was amazed. I watched so many of his videos. I just went crazy watching them. A lot of them are about 50 minutes, but it was fine. It was actually amazed me that people went out on backpacking trips by themselves and there was all this land out there that they could do it. And he's from North Carolina. And then from there, I found another channel called SyncTac77 and he did a similar thing. And what's funny is he was the first channel that did the Reflectix, Reflectix Pot Cozy. And then, oddly enough, Dixie wound up getting credited for influencing everyone. But he did it years before. But uh, I watched another channel called K-Dog Crazy. He hasn't been putting out any videos lately, but they were all basically solo backpackers. And I was kind of obsessed learning about it. And through the Outdoor Gear Review, I learned about the Appalachian Trail because he did some trips on there. And my mind was blown that there was a trail that was 2,190 miles long just out there in America. I mean, who knew that existed? I'm sure a lot of people did. Yeah. But I had no idea, and I'm sure nobody I knew had any idea that existed as well. And then once I learned about that... I looked into scenic trails and I found out there's an Ice Age trail in Wisconsin about an hour and a half from me. And then there was also like PCT, Continental Divide Trail, Arizona Trail, Colorado Trail, a whole bunch of them, Northwest Trail. So I looked into all of it, but I knew that I would get on the Ice Age Trail and just start hiking solo because I've never done that by myself either. So on March 16 of that same year, 2014, I went on my first solo hike in the woods in the Kettle Moraine State Forest, I believe. But it's a super narrow trail. Um, well, the forest is very narrow. So it's, I mean, it, you couldn't be any safer. If you get lost, you just go east or west and you're going to run into civilization and roads. And I hiked through that. Um, that was my first time. I was super paranoid. I had a nice day pack with food and like a mile hour blanket and you know, all the stuff, fire starter. And then I told my sister where I was going to be when I'm expected back. I had printouts of the maps for the area because I didn't use any navigation apps at the time. I don't even know if Gaia exists. They probably did, but I don't know anything. So I printed out maps, I had a compass, and I knew how to read maps and use compass pretty well from the Marine Corps. Um, so I wasn't worried at all about that. Um, and I went out there and it was March 16th. The woods were still covered in snow, maybe Everything was compacted down, but at spots there was about a little less than a foot of snow. But on the trail itself, everything was pretty compacted down. I didn't have micro spikes. I didn't know anything about them. I fell a few times, but I had a great time. I, it was so nice being like at home, I'd be alone. But the cell phone was always there and people from work would always email me. There's just constant things going on. But out in the woods, I just put it in airplane mode and it was so nice just being away for eight hours all by myself, super quiet because the snow muffles all that sound. I remember at one point I just laid down on a picnic table and just watched the clouds blow through the sky. 
and I finally found like, I mean, it sounds generic, but I found like such a peaceful moment. It, just, it changed me right there. Once I was done with that, I went on more day hikes up there and more and more. And then eventually, then on March 29th, just two weeks later, I decided I was going to go on another day hike. And then now there's no dispersed camping along there. You have to stay at established sites along the Ice Age Trail or at these shelters. But I found the shelters are booked solid. You can't get them anywhere. So my best option was to just do a day hike, carrying a full pack, and then go to the car, drive to one of the campgrounds along there, and then camp there with the rule that you can't go back to your car. So I went to a site where there was a walk-in site, about 100 yards. So I walked in with everything I had in my pack with the rule that I would not go back to the car. So I did that, and that was my first ever time sleeping outdoors by myself in the woods and I have to say I woke up every sound I heard <laughs> I woke up uh, I think they were just squirrels but every sound I heard I woke up and there aren't even any bears down there I think once in a long while someone will see one but there are no bears but yeah I woke up constantly um, it was a beautiful night though it looked oversaw a lake and sunset was beautiful and Overnight, it got to about 20 degrees Fahrenheit. So in the morning, <laughs> that was, uh, it was fun. Actually, it wasn't too cold or anything. I woke up in the morning, and I, but I learned that I used the alcohol stove at the time, that that does not work when it's below freezing. My lighter didn't work. <laughs> I was like, what? Why isn't this idea this working? And then that night, I found out when I got home and I Googled it all up that uh, the and cold temperatures and all that works. So lessons learned on that first night, but that was my first night alone away from my car. Two months after that, I decided I was going to go on my first backpacking trip. And I was planning on two nights in the North Northern Ice Age Trail up in North Wisconsin. The, the area I chose was because there are bears there and there's an active wolf pack there so i thought i'd get to see one probably not but hear something i was hoping for it but i planned for about an 18 mile one-way hike and then maybe do 12 and then do like eight back to the car but i got out there and uh i had like everyone else i had an osprey 65 liter pack full of all kinds of crazy stuff <laughs> a big survival knife because i want to just goof around while i was out there as well it was, uh, it was interesting. And I remember I actually videoed the whole trip. I'm not as good about recording as uh, other people are, but it's my first one. So I got a fire going for, to make an, a video out of it. Cause I watched all these other channels and I thought I can do it too. And, uh, I, I didn't make a video out of it. <laughs> Quality was so bad. I kept zooming in and out and I don't know, but First backpacking trip ever, um, I missed my turn off so many times. I hiked well over 20 miles that day, got scratched up by briars everywhere. And I finally got to my campsite, hung my bear bag. I set up a tarp to sleep in. I just had a footprint and a tarp, no tent. And it was beautiful. I had a fantastic time. It was dry, just absolutely beautiful time. I'll show you some of the footage from it. Never before seen footage. <laughs> yeah, it was a great time. But overnight, I decided to start heading back towards the car the next morning. And as I headed back though, I was looking for a campsite somewhere in the middle. But unfortunately, I guess the day before it was too cool for the ticks. I didn't see any, but this morning ticks were everywhere. They were just walking up my pants constantly. And I didn't feel like I was in any kind of brush. They were just climbing up from somewhere. Fortunately, I treated all my clothes with permethrin because I, I researched so much about everything and I did everything. So everything was treated permethrin. And although they say don't do it, I treated my underwear with permethrin because I didn't want any ticks getting in there because they like the soft tissue around that area. So I did that. Um, there was just so many ticks. I thought 
it was impossible for me to camp safely with just a tarp without full netting covering like surrounding me. So I decided to hike back. So it was another 20 mile day back to the car. And when I got to the car, I took off everything except my underwear and just did full tick check in the parking lot. And uh, I had the zip off type pants and on the top part, it overlaps the leg part like that. This crevice on both legs were not maybe not full, but there were just 50 ticks in there jammed in both legs altogether. They were all dead because they got up there and I guess they couldn't figure out how to get up further and all the, the permethrin basically killed them, but they were just lodged in there. Their legs held on even though they were dead. So I scratched all of them off. They were in my shoes. Tons were in my shoes and my socks. Um, I didn't find anywhere inside my underwear, but I was still glad I treated my underwear. Um, I found one on my back, but they were just crawling. The interesting thing is permethrin didn't kill them right away or repel them, but it weakened them. So as they start crawling up my leg, I actually saw several just fall off because they couldn't make it all the way. But if you're not going to be able to repel them altogether, you need something that'll weaken them. So it'll take, it'll, they'll move a lot slower. And when they bite, it's not as bad because they're still loopy. So permethrin uh, is the way to go. And I learned a lot from that trip. Now from Luke, I learned about the AT and Oceanic trails. And in 2014, I started watching some vlogs of the Appalachian trail. And I guess it was because of the certain vloggers I saw, but they just filmed all the parties that they were at, all the huge gatherings. They filmed at the shelters. They didn't really film the trail or the hike or just real little bits. And of course the quality wasn't as good. So I thought, oh, I don't know about the AT. It just seems so crowded. But then of course I knew about the other trails and I thought the PCT, I thought that's what I should do. It's not as long as the CDT. It's more scenic than the AT, although it's longer than AT. I thought there's less elevation change and less crowds. I thought I would do the PCT somewhere around mid 2014. I was thinking about getting on a through hike so I could just get away from everything. It felt like from the day hike to the single night, to multiple nights, all that backpacking was just a build up to get on a through hike and just disappear from the world for six months. In May of 2015, I started doing other backpacking trips. I did one in the Manistee River Trail Loop in Michigan. It goes along the North Country Trail for a little bit, half of it. But I did that, that was a two-nighter and I enjoyed it. One of the high highlights was an eagle, a bald eagle flew down the river and I was able to see it coming my way, turn the curve and then go away. And it was amazing. That's the kind of experience I want to have all the time. And I was uh, my first two night trip now and it was nice. It was good, nice, calm. It was raining the next day and the last day. And I learned a lot from that as well. Later in 2015, I was flipping through YouTube again, like I've been doing, and I saw Dixie's channel and I saw the video, her last video as it came out. I missed all the others. So I had to go back. But after her last video and watching some of the others, I decided, you know, AT doesn't seem too bad. I think it's definitely an option, but I still lean toward PCT at that time. On October 16, 2016 now, I went to Pictured Rocks National Lakeshore in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. I did a four night trip there and that was my first multi like big trip. And that was also the first one where you get picked up by a shuttle and dropped off way away from your car and you have to walk back to your car. So you really didn't have a choice. And I had an awesome time. The first night, there was a super extreme thunderstorm. The weather forecast on my phone had a black cloud. Usually I see red in storms, so there was a black right where I was. Uh, I thought everything was going to go flying. It rained and it was super windy. It was windy the entire time I was there and uh, I loved it. It was just so nice being out there. It was quiet. 
water everywhere. Um, a lot of it, you just heard Lake Superior slapping the seashore, not seashore, the lake shore. And it just, it was so peaceful again. Even with the extreme wind, extreme weather, I remember sitting back and thinking that I enjoyed it so much that I think, I think I really would enjoy a through hike. I didn't plan it that way, but when I was at Pictured Rocks, it was actually in peak leaf season. So the colors were just amazing. I recorded that as well. I even recorded the Manistee uh, backpacking trip, but I didn't turn that into a video. It wasn't good enough. But I also recorded the Pictured Rocks, but I thought that was good enough. I edited that into a two-part set and posted on YouTube. And that was in October, mid-October. About three weeks later, I decided I was gonna, well, I decided earlier, but three weeks later, I went to Great Smoky Mountain National Park. That, believe it or not, from where I lived, was the closest full-on mountains you can get to. Four-hour drive, but I mean, it's worth it. But it also was home to the parts of the Appalachian Trail. So I was looking forward to getting on there for the first time. So I planned out a loop where all, about half of it was on the AT itself. So that was November 7 in 2016. That was also, I planned for a four night, but I just opted for three. Um, I just walked extra the last day so I didn't have to stay at the last campsite I wanted to. But the first night, it was, well, the first day it was cold, but the first night I stayed at a shelter. I forget the name, I'll put it right here. Um, but that was, when I got there, I was all by myself. Odd, right? So I left some gear there and then went on to Rocky Top and then came back and nobody was there. So I ate, hung up my food bag and then went to bed and I was just laying in there and someone showed up. Um, that was my first through hiker I ever met. I can't remember her name. It was like Sunshine, Sun Smile, I forget. But she was going Sobo and then it was one of those two layer shelter so she slept in the bottom I stayed slayed up top and we were the only two there um, during that time there was a big drought so a lot of the springs were dry so on my way there I found a spring that was running so I collected a, a bunch of extra water and I gave it to her but uh, the next day I moved on and that was my first time at a shelter on the AT and uh, it actually was really nice so the second night I headed down this other trail where there were like nine stream crossings or something. So that was my first real, I wouldn't say real because none of them was dangerous at all. They were just like knee deep at most, but did all that. But uh, I went to Fontana Dam and then that's where the AT is. And I went up to AT and did some night hiking, camped at a campground all by myself. and. I was actually happy to see a sign. There was a big sign that said bear activity in this area, but uh, I got there in the dark. I didn't see or hear anything. And uh, by the next day, I didn't hear anything either. So I was kind of bummed, no bears. Although the next morning I saw a big old buck with huge antlers walking around. But that was my first experience on the AT and that was a three-nighter. The last day it rained so hard, you wouldn't believe it. Although it was good at the time because there were huge fires burning a lot of Gatlinburg. So yeah, it was actually good. That was another big backpacking trip that reinforced my idea that I would enjoy a through hike. That was November, 2016. And I knew I was gonna go on a through hike. So I sold my home July, 2017, just eight months later. So I sold it and I lived in an apartment in the fall, in September 2017, I got more ambitious and I wanted to hike the Wonderland Trail around Mount Rainier. If you don't know what that is, that's about a 96 mile trail that goes around all of Mount Rainier through all kinds of terrain. It has a lot of elevation change though. It was probably a bigger challenge than I should have taken on, especially without any good navigation. I was just gonna use Google Maps. <laughs> pretty bad but I went out there and unfortunately they had snow a lot of snow forecast for the second day so the rangers convinced me not to do it because I've never been in that kind of environment that high altitude alpine area and I figure once the snow came 
I would have trouble following the trail at all because I just don't know what to look for. I had no experience out there. So I opted for a few nights in lower terrain and that was the first time I used my Ursac Almighty and experienced the challenge of mice. Uh, I left my backpack outside my tent because it was soaking wet from the rain. I opened my hip pockets because I had food in them. I didn't want mice chewing in through them. So there's a slight smell still there. And uh, the next morning, there was a ton of mouse poop inside one of the pockets. The other one was clean. There was nothing in there at all. So I actually used a ton of toilet paper to clean all that out. It was horrible. And then I had an Ursac Almighty, but I hung it on a bear pole. And when I took it down, there, were, there was mouse poop all across the top. And because of the rain, it dissolved and just soaked into the fabric. In fact, my Ursac Almighty still has like dark spots on the top and that's, that's mouse poop. Cleaned it the best I could, but you know. But I stayed there for a little less than two weeks and just went to place to place, did a few more overnights here and there. Um, I got permits, walk up permits for each one. And I did a ton of day hikes and it was amazing. The views there are so amazing. I had micro spikes with me and I walked in a ton of snow and it was just so nice. If you ever get a chance to go do the Wonderland Trail, I'd say go do it. It only took, we did it later. Tina and myself, we went out there after PCT days in 2019. And then we did that uh, over five nights, just walk up permit. And it rained maybe two or three days out of the five days, <laughs> but it's so beautiful and just feels so, I don't know. It's it's not like a long through hike, but if you have a week, it's, it's a solid hike and you see different terrain all around Mount Rainier from all different angles. Totally worth it. Go check it out. So after the Mount Rainier trip in the fall, I actually told my work that I was going to quit my job in March of next year. I told them quite early because they were making long-term plans on what people were going to do. And then I didn't want them to include me in those plans because I would just screw it all up anyway. So I told them early so they could make plans to hire someone and rearrange everything. And I thought that worked out really well for them. Um, worked out well for me, although I was trying to find ways to get fired because uh, I, or laid off because I could have gotten pension for several months, but it never happened. I used to joke about what I'd have to do to get fired and we'd always uh, be goofing off. Anyway, so on March 22nd of 2018, I got to the southern terminus of the PCT and on September 26, 2018, hit the northern terminus. So on the entire trip, I connected almost every footstep except for a small chunk near Idlewild. And next year in March, I connected those. So I was able to get full connecting footsteps and every open section of the PCT done in that calendar year. So that was my big 2018. 2019, I built out my Forerunner and I had intentions to drive to the Southern Terminus and then just drive North and just kind of remembering the trail as I went and then helping hikers along the way. So I hit the Southern Terminus and then went on. The thing was on the PCT, I met Tina who's pocket rocket on trail in Northern Oregon, just before Cascade Locks. And uh, she was working in LA at the time. So near there, I actually visited her and then we basically just kind of hung out for <laughs> a couple of months. But from there, we went on all kinds of hikes. We went backpacking again in the Sierra for several, maybe four nights, climbed Mount Whitney. We did all kinds of things. We did the Cactus to Clouds Trail, which is from 500 feet. You go up to 10,800 feet, so it's quite uh, quite a hike. And um, there's good times that year. In the fall of 2019, Tina and I, we both went up to PCT days on the PCT at Cascade Locks. So as soon as we did with that, we went up to Mount Rainier and got permits for the Wonderland Trail. And then that, did a bunch more day hikes. And then we drove into Canada and went to Vancouver Island and spent a month there doing some backpacking as well. So 2020, of course, was COVID year and a lot of people didn't get to do much that year. 
And unfortunately, I got actually was able to do car life for a couple months and then went to Croatia for a couple months. And then during that time, though, I was just itching for another long hike and I didn't know what to do exactly. In late 2020, I was in Germany again and I decided I was going to do the AT. But I didn't know when. But I decided I was also going to just do the Arizona Trail and then support Tina as she did the Continental Divide Trail. Uh, so that worked out for 2021. As soon as I went home, less than a month later, I was on the AZT. Started February 17th, finished April 11th, met up with Tina, and then she started her through hike a week later. And this is where we are now. She finished her hike. We came back to Germany. And now, February 1st, maybe around there, 2022, I'll be starting the Appalachian Trail through hike. And I'm really looking forward to it, really looking forward to reliving some of the parts I was at. I still watch a ton of vloggers, PCT, AT, CDT, a lot of AT vloggers, and I really am looking forward to see the trail just covered in snow. I was really jealous of that. So I'm looking forward to it, believe it or not. A lot of people are not, but I have a lot of experience camping out in the cold now, so it's not too bad. So yeah. Hopefully I'll see any vloggers or anybody else hiking out there. There's gonna be a ton of people I realize. I'm a little early, so I might not see as many. But one thing I learned is to make quality vlogs, you have to stop a lot while you're hiking to film, film anything that interests you. So I'll be going very slowly, so I'm sure a lot of people will catch up. But February, just a few more months away getting my gear finalized again. I'm buying some newer items and uh, I'm excited to get going. When I finished the PCT, um, believe it or not, I was actually more sad than happy. I thought I'd be happier, but I was kind of confused. I was, I don't know if you've seen the final video, but I was expecting something different. I don't know, but I didn't feel like I was done. I needed more. I didn't get what I wanted out of it. Exactly what I wanted out of it, it's hard to say, but I just feel like I needed more of that. And when I did the Arizona Trail, I only saw a few hikers. I was early enough, I barely saw any other hikers. And I thoroughly enjoyed myself. And I felt better after that finished, but I know I think on the AT, I hope I get what I want out of it. It's gonna be an interesting time. Um, be a lot more people than I'm used to. It's gonna be a good time though. So I'm really looking forward to it. I like to hear everybody else's story on how they started backpacking, um, what got them into it. Was it just somebody's influence that got you or was there a reason? Was it something that you needed? I felt like at the time it was something I needed and it introduced me to the outdoor life in general and all the things that are out there and now I just there's no way I can go back to working at an office I just want to see more and more all the time I just want to go see everything that I see in other people's videos I just want to go to all these places and there's just no way you can do that if you're working even if you get a month off per year in vacation that's impossible. You could spend a month at a national park easily if you're trying to hike all the trails, maybe two weeks, but it just, it just, there's just so much to see and so much to do and not enough time in, in your life really. So any of you AT vloggers out there, any vloggers, anybody really that posts videos, if you have a video where you explain how you got into backpacking, or why or how it's helped you, just post a link to your video in the description below and then hopefully everyone can go through and see them. Um, I think it's nice to share because it could be, there could be people in similar circumstances now that have that feeling of wanting to get away that could benefit from backpacking, but maybe they're too afraid to go in by themselves and just not doing it. Um, it's hard to get into something when you don't know anybody that does it. Fortunately, there is the internet, so you can kind of learn everything you need, but I know it's difficult to get into. 
I wish that more people that decided to through hike the AT spent more time easing into it instead of just jumping in. That way they have more, a little more experience backpacking. So once they're on their through hike, that their chances of going all the way are much better than if they just decided that was their first trip or something. But that's my story. I hope somebody found it interesting. Uh, I'll talk to you later. Bye. Wave. Wave. Yes. Liza, stand. Good girl. Spin. Spin. Good girl. Guard. Guard. Good girl. Bow. Good girl. Stand. Scoot. 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 Liza, sit. Stand. Sit. Down. Stand. Down. Stand. Liza, nod. 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 Good girl. Head up. Liza, head up. Head up. Head down. Yes. Stand. Bang. Bang. <laughs> Liza, bang. Bang. Yes, come here. Come here. Good girl. Shake it. Shake it. Shake it.